diarthrodial or synovial joints. You should see a diagram right now on your screen which represents a typical diarthrodial or synovial joint. Why the two different names? Well, they are both naming the same kind of joints. Diarthrodial is a joint classification used when considering joint function like the degree of movement. So diarthrodial joints are freely movable, meaning they allow a lot of movement. So these are joints like the elbows, knees, and shoulders. In contrast, joints which only allow a slight degree of movement are called amphiarthrodial, and those which allow no movement are called synarthrodial. If, instead of considering joint function, you consider, you're considering joint structure, then these joints are called synovial joints. Synovial joints are formed by bones connected by ligaments, but the space between the bones is separated by a joint capsule and it has a lubricating fluid called synovial fluid. Because of this structure, they allow a lot of movement, so you see they're the same thing as diarthrodial joints. The reason they're named differently is because each name is based on a different method of classifying joints, either by function or structure. Get used to this kind of thing in anatomy. It all depends on how you look at it. The term diarthrosis is also used, so a diarthrosis means the same thing as a diarthrodial joint. And these are also sometimes called diarthrotic joints. These joints provide a low friction environment and they can withstand a great amount of wear and tear. Now, if you're really paying attention, you may have already come to the conclusion that diarthrodial or synovial joints are the main joints that let us move our bodies and move through space. And if you thought that's the majority of the joints in the body, you'd be right. In synovial joints, the ends of the bones are covered with a thin layer of hyaline cartilage and no cartilaginous tissue connects the bones together, so they are free to move in relation to one another. The bones are indirectly connected by a joint capsule formed by fibrous material that I mentioned before and that covers and encloses the joint. The inner surface of the joint cavity is lined with synovial material. <clears throat> These are either uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial joints and they don't all have the same type of freedom of movement. You know for instance that your knees and elbows work differently than your shoulders and hips, but they are all diarthrodial joints. To deal with this, these joints are divided into six more subgroups depending on the type of movement that occurs in them, which is allowed by their structure. There are actually alternative names for each one, but let's stick to the simple ones for now. The basic types are gliding joints, hinge joints, pivot joints, condyloid joints, saddle joints, and ball and socket joints. Each of these types has a different degree of movement. As we go into a description of these different types, you'll see diagrams that represent them, but keep in mind that no joint really fits perfectly into any one type. They are classified according to what type they resemble the closest. The first example is what I called a gliding joint because that helps me remember it. Another very common name for it is a plane or planar joint. It is also called an irregular joint and an arthrodial joint. The articulating surfaces are small and nearly flat or only slightly curved. The movement between these surfaces is a planar movement, which is a sliding or twisting movement. One example are the intercarpal joints of the wrist. In this image on your screen, I've circled the carpal bones of the wrist. All the little articulations between all these little irregular bones are gliding or plane joints. Another example are the intertarsal joints of the ankle and the ACL joint of the shoulder, which is at the top of your shoulder where your clavicle articulates with the scapula, and also the sternoclavicular joint where the clavicle articulates with the sternum. Here is a diagram which represents an idealized version of a plane or gliding joint. Next is the hinge joint or ginglimus joint. The surface of one bone is a convex cylinder and it fits into a shallow concave facet, sort of like a trough, on the other bone. Movement is a uniaxial, hinge-like motion and it's carried out in one plane only. This movement is basically flexion and it's reversed 
extension, or in other words, these joints bend or straighten. Examples are the elbow, knee, ankle, and the interphalangeal joints of the fingers. On your screen is an idealized version of such a joint. A pivot joint is also called a screw joint or trochoidal or trochoid joint. In these joints, there is a rotation about the long axis of a bone. The cylindrical surface of one bone articulates with a ring of bone and fibrous tissue on another to produce a rotation movement around the axis. An example is the joint between the elbow end of the radius and ulna bones of the forearm which must rotate around one another. We call this rotation supination or pronation. Another example is the articulation of the atlas and axis, the first two cervical vertebra of the neck, called the atlantoaxial joint. This joint rotates the head to the right or left. Here is a diagram showing the idealized image of a pivot joint. A condyloid joint is also called an ellipsoid or an ovoid joint. Here, a condyle on one end of a bone fits into a matching oval cavity in the end of another bone. A condyle is an oval or egg-shaped protrusion. These joints are biaxial and produce a variety of movements in different planes such as flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, or a combination of these movements. They are, however, incapable of producing rotation. Examples are the radiocarpal joint of the wrist where the radius articulates with the carpal bones and the occipital atlantal joint which is the joint between the head and the first cervical vertebra, the atlas. The metacarpal phalangeal and the metatarsal phalangeal joints of the fingers and toes are condyloid joints also. Shown here are drawings of the metacarpal phalangeal joints of the fingers. Here is an idealized image of a condyloid joint. A saddle joint is also called a cellar joint. Both articulating surfaces have concave and convex surfaces, and the surface of one fits into the complementary surface of another, much like two saddles turn 90 degrees to each other and fit together. You can demonstrate how a saddle joint works for yourself by cupping your hands and placing them together so that one hand is turned at a right angle to the other. Now slide your hands back and forth by moving the fingers forward. This is more or less how a saddle joint works. You can see that it allows a great deal of movement. These joints allow flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. An example is the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb. Here is an idealized image of a saddle joint. A ball and socket joint is also called an inarthroidal, spheroidal, or cotyloidal joint. The head of one bone is ball shaped and fits into the cup shaped socket of another bone. These are triaxial joints that produce movement in all planes and they are also able to rotate. Ball and socket joints are the most freely movable joints in the body, allowing flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and internal and external rotation. The shoulder and hip joints are ball and socket joints. Here is an idealized image of a ball and socket joint. 